Hi friends, in this video we are going to deal with the case summaries of the important Supreme Court judgments pronounced in the year 2022. To know more about it, please watch this video fully. If it is helpful to you, please like, share and comment and never forget to subscribe to it and further click on the bell icon next to the subscribe button. In the important judgment titled Lee Mama Matthew vs Indian vs Bank and Others, Pronounced on 17th November 2022, the defendant bank secured the disputed property in exercise of powers under the provisions of Safasi Act. The bank took the possession of the property pursuant to the order passed by the CJM in an application under Section 14 of the Surfacy Act. Thereafter, the plaintiff, who was ready and willing for purchase of the property, paid a total con sale consideration for the same. But the Tasilda submitted the report stating that the actual measurement of the land is 99.60 cents and the data already transferred 14.40 cents out of land measuring 54 cents prior to the creation of the mortgage. Despite the bow, the bank issued the sales certificate for 54 cents and handed over the possession of the secured property measuring 39.60 cents only however the sale consideration is, is issued for 54 cents. Thereafter the sale deed on the basis of the sale certificate was actually executed in favor of the plaintiff. Thus the plaintiff instituted the suit for recovery of damages or compensation with respect to 14.40 cents. The trial court decreed the suit. On appeal the Kerala High Court questioned set aside the decree passed by the trial court and dismissed the suit. Being agreed, the present appeal has been filed with the issues posed for consideration and they are whether suit barred by limitation and section 34 of Surfacy Act. The Supreme Court has held that the bank took the possession of the property auctioned on paper. However, the actual possession was handed over to the bank in pursuant to the order passed by the CJM. Thereafter, the Tasilda submitted the disputed report. Despite the above, the bank issued the sales certificate for 54 cents. However, handed over the possession of the secured property measuring 39.60 cents only. The sale consideration was, uh, received by the bank was for 54 cents. The sale certificate was registered in the month of October 2010. Thereafter, the plaintiff filed the suit for recovery of damages with respect to 14.40 cents. The final certificate was registered on 1-10-2010 and thereafter the suit was filed in the year 2012. So it cannot be said that the suit was barred by limitation. No issue was framed by the trial court on whether the suit is barred by limitation. The suit was for damages or compensation with respect to the balanced land which could not have been decided by the DRT or appellant tribunal. Section 34 of the Surfacy Act shall be applicable only in a case where the debt recovery tribunal and our appellate tribunal is empowered to decide the matter under the Surfacy Act. The plaintiff was not challenging the sale or sale certificate. The plaintiff claimed the damages or compensation with respect to the less area. Therefore, the High Court erred in holding that the suit was barred by Section 34 of the Surfacy Act. Further, right from the very beginning, the plaintiff insisted for handing over the possession of the 54 cents. When the property was put to action, even the bank was not in actual possession. The bank got possession pursuant to the order passed by the district magistrate and thereafter the measurement was done by Tasulda in which it was found that the actual area of land action was 34.60 cents and 14.40 cents was already transferred by the data much earlier. Therefore, at the relevant time when the property was put to action, even the bank was not aware of the actual measurement and went by the document and 54 cents was put to action. Considering the fact that the action notice was for 54 cents, the plaintiff submitted the offer of uh, rupees 32 lakhs 5000 for 54 cents. The plaintiff paid the actual amount of sale consideration, that is rupees 32 lakhs 5000 for 54 cents. 
the sole certificate was issued for 54 cents thereafter it was not open for the bank to contend that though the bank handed over the possession of the uh, 34.60 cents still the sale consideration recovered would be for 54 cents it was not open for the financial institution like the bank to take such a plea even otherwise, it is required to be noted that at least in the month of November 2007, when the Tasilda submitted the report, the bank was aware that the actual area is 34.60 cents and not 54 cents. Thereafter, the bank ought not to have issued the sales certificate for 54 cents. The bank ought to have been fair and ought to have issued the sales certificate only for 34.60 cents. This shows the contact on the part of the bank. Rule 8 of the Security Interest Enforcement Rules 2002 caused a duty on the authorized officer to take all precautions before putting the secured asset to sell. As per sub rule 5 of Rule 8, before effecting sale of the secured assets, the authorized officer sh shall obtain valuation of the property from an approved valuer and in consultation with the secure creditor and fix the reserve price of the property and may sell the whole or any pa uh, part of such immobile secured asset. Therefore, when the reserve price was fixed, the same was for 54 cents. Therefore, it can be presumed that the bank was aware that the actual area of the secured asset is less than 54 cents. As per section 54 of the Transfer of Property Act, the seller was bound to disclose any buyer any material defect in the property of which the buyer is not aware and which the buyer could not ordinarily discover. Under the circumstances also, the submission on behalf of the bank that the property was put to auction on as is where is and as is what is condition thereafter the plaintiff shall not be entitled to compensation of the less area cannot be accepted the high court erred in allowing the appeal and quashing and set aside the decree passed by the trial court consequently the judgment uh, that is the impact judgment and order passed by the high court is hereby quashed and set aside the judgment and decree passed by the trial court decreeing the suit is hereby restored. The bank to pay the decretal amount to the appellant with interest as per the decree passed by the trial court within a period of eight weeks from today. In the important judgment titled Bank of Rajasthan Limited versus VCK Shares and Stock Broking Services Limited, Pronounced on 10th November 2022, the appellant bank sanctioned a term loan to the respondent company. By mutual agreement, a further credit overdraft facility was granted. The respondent did not adhere to financial discipline, resulting in appellant issuing a notice calling upon the respondent to uh, settle the term loan account and overdraft facility account. Failure to make payment led appellant to seek a recovery certificate against the respondent. The respondent also filed civil suit before the Kolkata High Court, claiming a decree for sale of the pledged shares, a recovery of sale proceeds, and an inquiry into the losses suffered by the respondent along with a decree for payment of money after the sale. When the appellant sold the pledged uh, shares to adjust the amounts against the dues in view of the authorization available with them as a part of the loan transaction, the respondent filed civil suit before the Calcutta High Court. Appellant filed applications seeking rejection of the plaint and dismissal of the suits filed by the respondent on ground, ground of lack of jurisdiction. The single judge allowed both applications and directed the suits to be taken off from the file of the High Court. The appeals filed challenging single judge order came to be allowed by the division bench. Being aggrieved, the present appeals have been filed. The Supreme Court has held that Section 17 of the Recovery of Debts Due to Banks and Financial Institu Institutions Act 1993 bars the jurisdiction of the civil court only in respect of applications filed by the bank or financial institution, whereas did not bar the jurisdiction of civil court to try a suit filed by the borrower. There was also an absence of provisions in the Act for transfer of suits and proceedings, except Section 31, which relates to pending suit proceedings by a bank or financial institution for recovery of debt. 
the significant aspect of section 17 and 18 of the rdb act was that even after establishment of the drt no jurisdiction was conferred on it to try independent suits or proceedings initiated by the borrower or others against banks or financial institutions only a cross action in the form of a counterclaim by a defendant is permitted in the pending application to facilitate a unified proceeding a counterclaim in the bank's application before the drt was not the only remedy but an option available to the defendant borrower the borrower was not precluded from filing a separate suit or proceeding before a civil court or other appropriate forum not only that even the bank in whose application a counterclaim is made has the option to apply to the drt to exclude the counterclaim of the defendant while considering his application if the drt were to find in the bank's favor the defendant would have to approach the civil court in respect of such excluded counterclaim as the drt does not have jurisdiction to try an independent claim against the bank or the financial institution thus there are no restrictions on the power of a civil court under section 9 of the code unless expressly or impliedly excluded further a summary remedy is provided in respect of claims of banks and financial institutions so that recovery of the same may not be impeded by the elaborate procedure of the code the defendant has a right to defend the claim and file a counterclaim in view of subsection 6 and 8 of section 19 of the rdb act in case of pending proceedings to be transferred to the drt section 31 of the rdb act took care of the issue of mere transfer of the bank's claim or with, without transfer of the counterclaim thus if the debtor decides to institute a counterclaim that can be filed before the drt and will be tried along with the case however it is subject to a caveat that a bank may move for segregation of doubt counterclaim to be relegated to a proceeding before a civil court under section 1911 of the rdb act though such determination is to take place among with the determination of the claim for recovery of debt Thus, there is no provision by which the remedy of a civil suit by a defendant in a claim by the bank is, is ousted. But it is the matter of choice of that defendant. Such a defendant may file a counterclaim or may be desirous of availing of most strenuous procedure established under the court, and that is the choice which he takes with the consequences thereof. The legislature did not at any stage make any further amendment for excluding the jurisdiction of the civil court in respect of a claim of a defendant in such a proceeding being filed along with the suit. For the issue of the power of the civil court to transfer an independent proceeding instituted by a defendant to be tried alongside a recovery proceeding before the DRT, there is no specific power to transfer a suit to the DRT. A plaint can be returned only under the provisions of Order 7, Rule 10 of the Code for the reasons specified therein. In the absence of such reasons, Section 151 of the Code cannot be utilized as a residuary power to achieve the transfer, which is really a consequence of return of the plaint when the grounds under Order 7, Rule 10 of the Code are not satisfied. The absence of any legislative power cannot give a power by implication to the civil court. It would not be appropriate to read such power to transfer a suit to a DRT under section 151 of the court when the DRT is a creature of a statute and that statute does not provide for such eventuality. Even where a defendant is to invoke the jurisdiction of the DRT by filing a counterclaim, the bank has the right to seek a relegation of that claim to the civil court and the DRT has been empowered to do so, albeit at the final adjudication stage. This is so in view of the summary nature of the remedy provided before the DRT and thus if certain inquiries beyond the contours of what the DRT does are envisaged, a civil court remedy may be considered as a appropriate. Once there is no power of transfer in the civil court, the consent or absence of it is not something which would lend such power to the civil court. The option before the defendant who has instituted the suit is clear. Either he could file a counterclaim before the DRT or he could institute separate civil proceedings. 
it is not open to a defendant who may have taken a recourse to the civil court to seek a stay on the decision of the DRT awaiting the verdict of his suit before the civil court as it is a matter of his choice. In case of such an option exercised by the defendant who filed an independent suit, the claim petition under the DRDP Act would continue to proceed expeditiously in terms of the procedure established therein to come to a conclusion whether a debt is due to a bank and or financial institution and whether a recovery certificate ought to be issued in that big of. The fact in the present case is that the proceedings under the RDP Act have reached a culmination with satisfaction of the claim and thus no proceedings instituted by the appellant are pending before the DRT. As for the suit, there is no question of a counterclaim or a transfer or any other manner other than trial of the suit instituted by the respondent. In fact, some part of the claim of the bank was not even allowed and some adjustments were directed to be made. Even thereafter, so far as any other claims of the respondent are concerned, the DRT permitted the respondent to pursue the remedy in accordance with law, which can only mean the civil proceedings. Thus, the suit is liable to proceed accordingly. Further, the judgments in United Bank of India, Calcutta versus Abjit T. Company Private Limited and others reported in 2007 SSC 357 and State Bank of India versus Ranjan Chemicals Limited and another reported in 2007 1 SSC 97 are held not to be laying down the correct legal proposition. The judgments in Indian Bank versus ABS Marine Products Private Limited reported in 2006-5 SCC 72 and Nagar Industrial Enterprises Limited versus Hong Kong and Shanghai uh, Banking Corporation reported in 2009-8 SCC 646 are affirmed except to the extent that they allow the transfer of a suit from the civil court to the DRT. So in the important judgment titled Union of India and Anadas versus Ganpati Dealcom Private Limited, which was pronounced on 23rd August 2022, the Supreme Court has held that Section 3 Clause 2 of the Benami Transactions Prohibition Act 1988 as unconstitutional on the ground of being manifestly arbitrary. The facts of the case would be that the respondent company purchased a property in its name from various sellers. The adjudicating authority issued a notice to the respondent invoking Section 24, Clause 1 of the Benami Transactions Prohibition Amendment Act 2016 to show cause as to why the aforesaid property should not be considered as Benami property and the uh, respondent as Benami Dar within the meaning of Section 2, Clause 8 of the 2016 Act. Thereafter, the adjudicating authority passed an order under Section 24 Clause 4, subclause B, subclause 1 of the 2016 Act, provisionally attaching the property. Being aggrieved, the respondent filed a writ petition before the Calcutta High Court and the same was disposed of by the single judge with a direction to the adjudicating authority to conclude the proceedings within 12 weeks. On appeal, the High Court, while quashing the show cause notice, held that the 2016 Act does not have retrospective application. And agreed by the aforesaid impound order, the Union of India is in appeal before the court. The short legal question which arises for the consideration is whether the 1988 Act as amended by the 2016 Act has a prospective effect. To put it differently, whether Section 3, Subclause 1 and Chapter 4 read with Section 5 of 2016 Act have retrospective effect or not. The Supreme Court has held that Section 3 Clause 1 of 1988 Act is vague and arbitrary. Section 3 Clause 1 of 1988 Act created an unduly harsh law against settled principles of law commission recommendations. Section 5 of 1988 Act, the provision relating to civil forfeiture was manifestly arbitrary. Both provisions were unworkable as a matter of fact were never implemented. As Section 3 and 5 were held to be unconstitutional under the 1988 Act, it would mean that the 2016 amendments were creating new provisions and new offences. 
Therefore, there was no question of retrospective application for the 2016 Act. As for the offence under Section 3, Clause 1, for those transactions that were entered into between 5-9-1988 to 25-10-2016, the law cannot retrospectively inviolate a stillborn criminal offence as established. The offence under the provisions of Section 53 of the 2016 Act is prospective and only applied to those transactions that were entered into after the amendment came into force, which is 25-10-2016. Any contrary interpretation of Section 3 of the 1988 Act would be violative of Article 20, Clause 1 of the Constitution, which deals with protection and respect to conviction of offences. The 2016 Act containing the criminal provisions is applicable only prospectively. As the relevant sections of the pre-amended 1988 Act containing the penal provisions declared as unconstitutional. Therefore, the question of construction of the 2016 Act as retrospective for the penal provisions under uh, sections 3 or 53 does not arise. Although section 5 of the 1988 Act was held to be unconstitutional for being manifestly arbitrary, however, such holding is of no consequence if it is concluded that the confiscation under Section 5 of the 2016 Act, read with Chapter 4, was civil in nature and is not punitive. The legislature has power to enact retrospective civil legislations under the Constitution. However, Article 20, Clause 1 mandates that no law mandating a punitive provision can be enacted retrospectively. Further, a punitive provision cannot be couched as a civil provision to bypass the mandate under Article 20, Clause 1, which follows the settled legal principle that what cannot be done directly can also not be done indirectly. Acquisition under the earlier 1988 Act as well as the confiscation under the 2016 Act are said to have been enacted on a reasoning that the property emanating from the Benami transaction also gets tainted. The substantive difference between the acquisition provision under the earlier enactment and the confiscation provision under the 2016 Act is that proceeds of Benami transactions have been made traceable under the 2016 Act. Further, under the Indian Penal Court, forfeiture is uh, recommended to be a form of punishment under Section 53. Accordingly, the Criminal Procedure Court provides for a mechanism for interim custody and forfeiture at the conclusion of trial under Section 451 of the Criminal Procedure Code, which reads as, which reads as, uh, I'm sorry, order for custody and disposal of property pending trial in certain cases. The 2016 Act contemplates an in rem forfeiture wherein the taint of entering into such a Benami transaction is transposed to the asset itself and the same becomes liable to confiscation. At the cost of repetition, it may be noted that the taint of Benami transactions is not restricted to the person who is entering into the aforesaid transaction. Rather, it attaches itself to the property perpetually and extends itself to all the proceeds arising from such property unless the defense of innocent ownership is established under Section 27, Clause 2 of the 2016 Act. When such a taint is being created not on the individual but on the property itself, a retrospective law would characterize itself as punitive for condemning the proceeds of sale which may also involve legitimate means of addition to wealth. In view of the fact that this court has already held that the criminal provisions under, section, uh, under the Act of 1988 were arbitrary and incapable of application, the law through the 2016 amendment could not retrospectively apply for confiscation of those transactions entered into between 5-9-1988 to 25-10-2016, as the same would be tantamount to punitive punishment in the absence of any other form of punishment. It is this unique circumstance that confiscation contemplated under the period between 5-9-1988 and 25-10-2016 would characterize itself as punitive if such confiscation is allowed retrospectively. Usually, 
when confiscation is enforced retrospectively the logical reason for accepting such an action would be that the continuation of such a property or instrument would be dangerous for the community to be left free in circulation further the continuation of only the civil provisions uh, provisions under section 4 etc would mean that the legislative intention was to ensure that the ostensible owner would continue to have full ownership over the property without allowing the real owner to interfere with the rights of the benamida if that would be the case then without effect any enforcement proceedings for a long span of time the rights that have crystallized since 1988 would be in jeopardy such implied intrusion into the right of property cannot be permitted to operate retrospectively as that would be unduly harsh and arbitrary therefore section 3 clause 2 of the unamended 1988 act is declared as unconstitutional for being manifestly arbitrary accordingly section 3 clause 2 of the 2016 act is also unconstitutional as it is violative of article 20 clause 1 of the indian constitution in rem for feature provision under section 5 of the unamended act of 1988 prior to the 2016 amendment act was unconstitutional for being manifestly arbitrary the 2016 amendment act was not merely procedural rather prescribed substantive uh, provisions in rem for feature provisions under section 5 Of the, of the 2016 Act, being punitive in nature, can only be applied prospectively and not retrospectively. Concerned authorities cannot initiate or continue criminal prosecution or confiscation proceedings for transactions entered into prior to the coming into force of the 2016 Act, which is 25/10/2016. As a consequence of the above declaration, all such prosecutions or confiscation proceedings shall stand quashed. So that's it for today. Just in case you have any confusion, you guys can uh, comment uh, below the video. In the important judgment titled Ahmednagar Mahanagar Palika vs Ahmednagar Mahanagar Palika Kamgar Union pronounced on 5th September 2022 the Supreme Court has held that appointment to the heirs of the employees on their retirement superannuation is violative of articles 14 and 15 of constitution. The facts of the case would be that an industrial dispute was raised by the union with respect to the employment to be given to the heirs of the employees. By the award the industrial court directed that the employees in class 4 category if they die before their retirement if they become invalid or if they retire their heirs should be given appointment in their place. The direction was based on a settlement award between the employees union and the Mahanagar Palika in which one of the demands by the union was that legal heirs of the employees must be employed on retirement. The awards passed by the industrial court were the subject matter of writ petitions before the Gujarat High Court. By the impugned judgment and order, the High Court dismissed those writ petitions. Being aggrieved, the original writ petitioner who is the Ahmednagar Mahanagar Palika through its commissioner preferred the present appeals. The Supreme Court has held that in the present case the industrial court directed the Mahanagar Palika or Municipal Corporation to give appointment to the heirs of the employees on their superannuation or retirement as per judgment and award passed in the year 1981 at the time when the municipal council was in existence. Thereafter in the year 2003 the municipal council was converted to municipal corporation or Mahanagar Palika and all the employees under Mahanagar Palika or municipal corporation are governed by the scheme or rules and regulations framed by the state which does not provide for any appointment on compassionate grounds or the appointment to the heirs of the employees on their superannuation or retirement Even otherwise it is required to be noted that in reference it no to 1993 which was at the instance of Mahanagar Palika on the notice of change in respect of demand of employment to the heirs of the employee as per reference it number 51 of 1979 the industrial court directed the appointment on compassionate grounds to the heirs of the deceased employees only It was specifically observed by the industrial court that at the time of passing earlier award the demand to provide the employment to the legal heirs of the employees on their retirement or superannuation was reasonable however in the present situation the said demand does not appear to be good and reasonable 
It was not open for the industrial court and or even the high court to direct the Mahanagar Palika or Municipal Corporation to provide appointment to the heirs of the employees on their retirement or superannuation, relying upon the judgment and award passed by the industrial court in reference IT No. 51 of 1979. After the conversion of the Municipal Council to Municipal Corporation or Mahanagar Palika, the employees of the Mahanagar Palika or Municipal Corporation shall be governed by the scheme framed by the state and at par with the government employees which does not provide for appointment on compassionate grounds to the heirs of the employees on their retirement and or superannuation. Even otherwise, such an appointment to the heirs of the employees on their retirement and or superannuation shall be contrary to the object and purpose of appointment on compassionate grounds and as hid by Article 14 of the Constitution. Compassionate appointment shall always be treated as an exception to the normal method of recruitment. The appointment on compassionate grounds is provided upon the death of an employee in harness without any kind of security whatsoever. The appointment on compassionate grounds is not automatic and shall be subject to the strict scrutiny of various parameters including the financial position of the family, the economic dependence of the family upon the deceased employee and the avocation of the other members of the family. No one can claim to have a vested right for appointment on compassionate grounds. Therefore, appointment on compassionate grounds cannot be extended to the heirs of the employees on their superannuation and or retirement. If such an appointment is permitted, in that case, outsiders shall never get an appointment, and only the heirs of the employees on their superannuation, and or retirement shall get an appointment, and those who are the outsiders shall never get an opportunity to get an appointment, though they may be more meritorious, and or well educated, and or more qualified. Therefore, the submission on behalf of the respondent that the appointment is not on compassionate grounds, but the same be called as varus hack cannot be accepted. Even if the same be called as varus hack, the same is not supported by any scheme, and even the same also can be said to be violative of Article 14 as well as Article 15 of the Constitution of India. In view of the above, and for the reasons stated above, both the judgment and award passed by the Industrial Court, as well as the High Court in directing the Mahanagar Palika or Municipal Corporation to give appointment, to the heirs of the employees on their superannuation and or retirement is unsustainable, and the same deserves to be quashed and set aside. In the important judgment titled The State of Manipur and Others versus Bayam Ayum Abdul Hanan Alais Anand and Anada pronounced on 19th October 2022, the main thrust on which the writ petition was filed assailing the detention order was that respondent number one was not supplied with legible copies of the documents relied upon by the detaining authority and took away the valuable right of respondent number one in making an effective representation. Further, the right to make and representation is a fundamental right and non-supply of the legible copies of the documents relied upon by the authorities in passing the detention order is in violation of Article 22.5 of the Constitution. Manipur High Court set aside the detention order passed under prevention of illicit traffic in narcotic drugs and psychotropic substances Act 1988. Being aggrieved, the present appeals have been filed. The Supreme Court has held that Article 22.5 of the Constitution confers two rights on the detainee. Firstly, the right to be informed of the grounds on which the detention order has been made. And secondly, to be afforded an earliest opportunity to make a representation against the detention order. Also, right to make a representation implies that the detainee should have all the information that will enable him to make an effective representation. This right is again subject to the right or privilege given by Class 6. At the same time, refusal to supply the documents requested by the detainee or supply of illegible or blurred copies of the documents relied upon by the detaining authority amounts to violation of Article 22.5 of the Constitution. The right to make representation is a fundamental right of the detainee under Article 22.5 of the Constitution and supply of the illegible copy of the documents which were relied upon by the detaining authority indeed deprived him in making an effective representation and denial thereof will hold the detention order Ill illegal and not in accordance with the procedure contemplated under law. 
it is the admitted case of the parties that respondent number one failed to question before the detaining authority that illegible or blurred copies were supplied to him which were relied upon while the while passing the detention order but the right to make representation being a fundamental right under article 225 of the constitution in order to make effective representation the detainee is always entitled to be supplied with the legible copies of the documents relied upon by the detaining authority and such information made in the grounds of detention enables him to make an effective representation further it was specifically raised by the respondents in their writ petition and the reference was made in the petition referred and in the pleadings on record there was no denial in the counter file by the appellants before the high court that the documents which were supplied and relied upon by the detaining authority were legible and that did not deny response number one in making effective representation while questioning the detention order once this fact remained uncontroverted from the records as being placed before the high court and the legal principles being settled this court finds no substance in the submissions made by learned counsel for the appellants that merely because uh, respondent number one failed to raise this question before the detaining authority which go into root of the matter to take away the right vested in the detainee in assailing the detention order while availing the remedy available to him under article 226 of the constitution therefore this court finds no error being committed by the high court in setting aside the detention order the important judgment titled pharmacy council of india versus rajiv college of pharmacy and others pronounced on 15th september 2022 the supreme court has held that the right to establish an educational institution is a fundamental right under article 19 1 g of the constitution of india and reasonable restrictions on such a right can be imposed only by a law and not by an execution instruction the facts of the case would be that by way of a resolution pharmacy council of india resolved to impose a moratorium on the opening of new pharmacy colleges for running diploma as well as degree courses in pharmacy for a period of five years starting from academic year 2020 to 2021 Thereafter, the resolution was modified to the extent that, in Talia, the moratorium was relaxed for government institutions and institutions in the northeastern region and states or union territories wherein the number of institutions offering D. Farm and B. Farm courses, both combined, are less than 50. The writ petitions filed by the institutions before the three high courts challenged the validity of the said moratorium and also prayed for a direction to be issued to the appellant to grant approval for opening new pharmacy institutions imparting pharmacy courses for the ensuing academic year of 2022 to 2023 on the basis of inspection conducted by the Pharmacy Council of India in February 2020 and to not insist on fresh applications from the institutions pursuant to the circular of the Pharmacy Council of India, which was issued in compliance of the interim order of this court dated 31st May 2022, and the same were allowed. Being aggrieved, the present appeals have been filed. The moot question, therefore, that requires consideration, is as to whether the moratorium, as imposed by the Central Council of the Appellant, could have been imposed by the said resolution which is in the nature of an executive instruction of the Central Council. The Supreme Court has held that the constitution bench of this court in TMA Pi Foundation vs. State of Karnataka, and others reported in 2002, 8 SCC 481 holds that in view of Article 19, 1 G, and Article 26 of the Constitution, all citizens and religious denominations are conferred with the right to establish and maintain educational institutions. Also, the constitution bench of this court in PA Inamdar and others versus state of Maharashtra and others reported in 2005, 6 SCC 537 again reiterated that the right to impart education is a fundamental right under Article 19, 1, G of the constitution and, therefore, subject to control by clause 6 of Article 19. 
Such a right is subject to the laws imposing reasonable restrictions in the interest of the general public. The laws may be enacted for prescribing the professional or technical qualifications necessary for practicing any profession or carrying on any occupation, trade or business. The laws could also be enacted for the purposes of the carrying on by the state or by a corporation owned or controlled by the state of any trade, business, industry or service whether to the exclusion, complete or partial of citizens or otherwise. Also, a citizen cannot be deprived of the said right except in accordance with law. The requirement of law for the purpose of clause 6 of Article 19 of the Constitution can by no stretch of imagination be achieved by issuing a circular or a policy decision in terms of Article 162 of the Constitution or otherwise. Such a law must be one enacted by the legislature. The right to establish an educational institution is a fundamental right under Article 19 1G of the Constitution, and reasonable restrictions on such a right can be imposed only by a law, and not by an execution instruction. Therefore, the view taken by the High Courts of Karnataka, Delhi and Chhattisgarh lays down the correct position of law. Since the resolutions or communications of the Central Council of the Appellant, which are in the nature of executive instructions, could not impose restrictions on the fundamental right to establish educational institutions under Article 19, 1, G, of the Constitution, this Court does not find it necessary to consider the submissions advanced on other issues. Thus, the resolutions or communications of the Central Council of the Appellant are liable to be struck down on this short ground. Further, there could indeed be a necessity to impose certain restrictions so as to prevent mushrooming growth of pharmacy colleges. Such restrictions may be in the larger general public interest. However, if that has to be done, it has to be done strictly in accordance with law. If and when such restrictions are imposed by an authority competent to do so, the validity of the same can always be scrutinized on the touchstone of law. The applications seeking approval for D, Farm and B, Farm courses are required to be accompanied by a no objection certificate from the state government and consent of affiliation from the affiliating bodies. While scrutinizing such applications, the council can always take into consideration various factors before deciding to allow or reject such applications. Merely because an institution has a right to establish an educational institution does not mean that such an application has to be allowed. In a particular area, if there are more than sufficient number of institutions already existing, the Central Council can always take into consideration as to whether it is necessary or not to increase the number of institutions in such an area. However, a blanket prohibition on the establishment of pharmacy colleges cannot be imposed by an executive resolution. In the important judgment titled Niraj Datta vs. State, a government of density of Delhi, pronounced on 15th December 2022, the issue as to whether the demand for illegal gratification could be established by other evidence in absence of complainant relating in direct evidence of demand owing to the non-availability of the complainant or owing to his death or other reason was referred to the Constitution Bench of the Supreme Court. The Supreme Court has held that proof of demand and acceptance of illegal gratification by a public servant as a fact in issue by the prosecution is a sine qua non in order to establish the guilt of the public servant under section 7 and 13 1d 1 and 2 of the act. In order to bring home the guilt of the accused, the prosecution has to first prove the demand of illegal gratification and the subsequent acceptance as a matter of fact. This fact in issue can be proved either by direct evidence which can be in the nature of oral evidence or documentary evidence. Further, the proof of demand and acceptance of illegal gratification can also be proved by circumstantial evidence in the absence of direct oral and documentary evidence. In order to prove the demand and acceptance of illegal gratification by the public servant, the following aspects have to be followed and they are the first one is, if there is an offer to pay by the bribe giver without there being any demand from the public servant 
and the latter simply accepts the offer and receives the illegal gratification, it is a case of acceptance as per section 7. In such a case, there need not be a prior demand by the public servant. The second one is, on the other hand, if the public servant makes a demand and the bribe, bribe giver accepts the demand and tenders the demanded gratification which in return is received by the public servant, it is a case of obtainment. In the case of obtainment, the prior demand for illegal gratification emanates from the public servant. This is an offence under section 13, 1D, 1 and 2. The third one is, in both the cases, the offer by the bribe giver and the demand by the public servant respectively have to be proved by the prosecution. In other words, mere acceptance or receipt of an Ill illegal gratification without any anything more would not make it an offence under section 7 or section 13 1D, the subclasses 1 and 2 respectively. Therefore, under section 7, in order to bring home the funds, there must be an offer which emanates from the bribe giver, which is accepted by the public servant, which would make it an offence. Similarly, a prior demand by the public servant when accepted by the bribe giver, and in turn there is a payment made which is received by the public servant, would be an offence of obtainment under section 13, 1D and 1 and 2 of the subclasses. The presumption of fact with regard to the demand and acceptance or obtainment of illegal gratification may be made by the court of law by way of inference only when the foundational facts have been proved by relevant oral and documentary evidence and not in the absence thereof. On the basis of the material on record, the court has the discretion to raise a presumption of fact while considering whether the fact of demand has been proved by the prosecution or not. Of course, the presumption of fact is subject to rebuttal by the accused and in the absence of rebuttal, the presumption stands. In the event the complainant turns hostile or died or is unavailable to let in his evidence during trial, Demand of illegal gratification can be proved by letting in the evidence of any other witness who can again let in evidence either orally or by documentary evidence or the pr uh, prosecution can prove the case by circumstantial evidence. The trial does not abate nor does it result in an order of acquittal of the accused in so far as uh, section 7 is concerned on the proof of act in issue. Section 20 mandates the court to raise a presumption that the legal gratification was for the purpose of motive or reward as mentioned in the said section. The said presumption has to be raised by the court as a legal presumption or a presumption in law. Of course, the said presumption is also subject to rebuttal. Section 20 does not apply to Section 13, 1D, the subclasses 1 and 2. Accordingly, the Supreme Court has held that in absence of direct or primary or oral or documentary evidence, it is permissible to draw an inferential deduction of culpability or guilt of a public servant under Section 7 and Section 13 1D read with Section 13 2 based on other evidence adduced by the prosecution. In the important judgment titled Independent Schools Federation of India versus Union of India and Another's, which was pronounced on 29th of August 2022, the Supreme Court has upheld the Amendment of Payment of Gratuity Act 1972 extending the benefit of gratuity to teachers. The facts of the case would be that in exercise of powers conferred by Clause C to Section 1 Clause 3 of Payment of Gratuity Act, the provisions of the Act were made applicable to the local bodies in which 10 or more persons are employed as a class of establishments. So, as a result, the schools under the local bodies with 10 or more employees became liable to pay gratuity to their employees. However, the notification did not apply to private schools. By another notification, the provisions of the Act were made applicable to the educational institutions with 10 or more employees. The private schools being educational institutions in which 10 or more persons are employed became liable to pay gratuity to their employees as per the provisions of the Act. Later, based on the recommendations of the Standing Committee, Section 2 Clause E was amended with retrospective effect from 3rd April 1997. Further, Section 13A was also inserted with effect from 3rd April 1997.
However, several private schools challenged the constitutional validity of the amendments in writ petitions and the same were dismissed by seven high courts. These appeals, by the way, of special leave impung those dis uh, disputed judgments. Some private schools also filed writ petition under Article 32 of the Constitution alleging that the Amendment Act 2009 overrules the judicial decision of Ahmedabad Private Primary Teachers Association versus Administrative Officers and Others, which was reported in 2004, and violates the doctrine of separation of powers and the retrospective amendments are unreasonable, excessive and harsh and therefore unconstitutional. The Supreme Court has held that the first ground should not be uh, should not hold this court for long, as the legislation in question rectifies the infirmities and defects pointed out by the court, and the amended clause E to section two defining the word employee and the newly inserted section thirteen A with retrospective effect from third April nineteen ninety seven effectuate and catalyze the object and purpose of notification in question. This power to legislate with retrospective effect which vests in, the, in every sovereign legislature is not taken away by court's decision. However, a court's decision, a decision cannot be overruled by the legislature. The legislature can amend the language of the provisions that was the subject matter of the court decision and such an amendment does not overrule the court's decision. Where the law as in uh, the present case was amended and the defects were removed or cured, the law changes and therefore the earlier interpretation is no longer applicable and becomes irrelevant. Which enacts the laws and uh, the courts which interpret the laws as enacted. Doctrine of separation of power demarcates the exclusive domains of the legislature which enacts the laws and the courts which interpret the law as enacted. The earlier decision in Ahmedabad Private Primary Teachers Association's case interpreted the law that is Section 2 Clause E as it uh, then existed in the statute. The judgment even acknowledged and prompted the legislature to enact a legislation granting the benefit of gratuity to teachers who were excluded because of the legal flaw. When the legislature acts within its power to usher in a valid law and rectify the legal error, even after a court ruling, the legislature exercises its constitutional power to enact the law and does not overrule an earlier court's decision. The second ground is again devoid of any merit and substance. The legislature wide the Amendment Act 2009 gave retrospective effect to the amendment provision of Section 2 Clause E and the newly inserted Section 13A with effect from 3rd April 1997, which is also the date of the notification issued by the government, making the Act applicable to the educational institution. The amendment enforces and gives effect to what was intended by the notification but could not be achieved on account of technical and legal defects. The lacuna uh, distortion in the language uh, that had the unwitting effect of leaving out teachers was rectified so as to achieve the object and purpose behind the issuance of the notification, making the act applicable to all the other educational institutions. The argument of the educational institutions that they were taken by surprise is incorrect uh, and unacceptable as the legislation cured the inadvertent defect in the statute through legislative repair. Private schools, when they claim a vested right arising from the reason of defect should not succeed for acceptance would be at the expense of teachers who were denied and deprived of the intended benefit. Marginal inconvenience in the form of financial outgo or difficulty is of little way. When curing of an inadvertent defect is made retrospectively in general public interest, which consideration will overrule the interest of one or some institutions. This court finds little merit in this argument also for the reason that the observation of the court in Ahmedabad Private Primary Teachers Association's case was sufficient to indicate that a legislation should intervene to grant the benefit of gratuity to teachers. The contention that the private schools were sure to su uh, succeed as to deny the teachers the benefit of the notification in question is questionable and far-fetched to be accepted. The challenge was contested and remained pending before the high courts and then this court. The private schools relied on some judgments of this court, but th these judgments interpreted the word employee 
under other enactments the law is subject to uncertainty ex ante when two or more views are possible but there may be certainty ex post uh, litigation in view of the law of precedence which reduces uncertainty also the argument of unreasonableness and that the amendment is financially uh, confiscatory predicted or uh, 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 predicated on a uh, past liability which may predate the notification effected from 3rd april 1997 is to be rejected as there are upper cap limit on payment of gratuity therefore through gratuity uh, though gratuity i'm sorry uh, though gratuity uh, is computed with reference for years of service in view of the upper cap limit the payment towards gratuity cannot exceed the specified amount even if the employee would be entitled to higher amount in view of the years of service rendered to the employer the provisions of the act even post the retrospective amendments will apply only to those teachers who were in the service as on 3rd april 1997 and at the time of termination rendered service of not less than 5 years the period of 5 years may be partly before 3rd april 1997 as the date on which the person was employed does not determine the applicability of the act the date of termination of service in the form of superannuation retirement or resignation or death or disablement due to accident or disease should be post the enforcement date which is uh, which in the present case is 3rd april 1997 the entire length of service including the service period prior to 3rd april 1997 is to be counted for the purpose of computing the entitlement condition for 5 years of service further the school has claimed violation of article 14 and uh, 191g 21 and 300 and uh, 300a uh, of the constitution of india which are not violated as to deny gratuity benefits to teachers upon enforcement of the notification in question was itself anomaly which uh, mandated correction a supplementary submission of the private schools was that the judgments of the court upholding retrospective amendments are valid only when uh, there is a tax implication as the government has also refunded the paid taxes is unfounded and irrational the power to amend which includes the power to amend the statute with retrospective effect is a constitutional power vested with the legislature which is not confined and restricted to any particular type of statutes namely tax statutes so in case the constitutional validity of the amendment act is challenged the court is entitled to examine the relevant circumstances which prompted the legislature to make retrospective amendment judicial review when a validity of an amendment act is challenged as decided on the grounds of lack of legislative competence violation of the fundamental rights or any other provisions of the constitution of india so in the present case the notification in question ensured that the benevolent provisions require uh, requiring the payment of gratuity should be extended to the employees of the educational institution the amendment with retrospective effect is to make the benevolent provisions equally applicable to teachers the amendment seeks to bring equality and give fair treatment to the teachers it can be uh, hardly be categorized as an arbitrary and high handed exercise the last contention raised by the private schools and writ petitioners is predicate, uh, uh, predicated on the enactment of the repealing and amending act 2016 by virtue of which the amendment act 2009 was repealed the argument overlooks section a of the general clauses act 1897 and section 4 of the repealing and amendment act section 4 of the repealing and amendment act states that the repeal shall not affect any of the enactment in which the repealed enactment was applied incorporated and referred to it also states that the repealing act shall not affect validity invalidity effect or consequences of anything already done or suffered or any right title obligation or liability already acquired accrued or incurred etc therefore the private schools would make the payment to the employees or teachers along with the interest in accordance with the provisions of the act within a period of 6 weeks from today and in, uh, I, in uh, today uh, as in on that day when the judgment was pronounced and in case of default the employees or the teachers may move to the appropriate forum to enforce payment in accordance with the provisions of the act 
so that's it for today uh, just in uh, just in case of any confusion or any question you guys can uh, comment down this uh, video important judgment title shrimati katta sujhata reddy and another uh, versus sidham shetty infra projects private limited and others which was pronounced on 25th of august 2022 The Supreme Court has held that the 2018 amendment to the Specific Relief Act is a prospective and uh, cannot apply to those transactions that took place prior to its coming into the force. The facts of the case would be that the respondent filed a suit for specific performance against the appellants. The trial court dismissed the suit holding that the plaintiff was not entitled for the relief of specific performance. On appeal the Telangana High Court held that specific relief in essence is a part of law of procedure and hence 2018 amendment is retrospective being agreed the present appeal has been filed the issues posted for consideration are number 1 whether the suit for specific performance is barred by limitation number 2 is whether the amendment under section 10 of specific relief act is prospective or retrospective in operation number 3 is whether the purchaser is entitled to the relief of specific performance number 4 in any case whether the purchaser is entitled to take benefit of section 12 of the specific relief act in view of the part payment made in respect of the contract so the supreme court has held that the record show that the contract was strictly conditioned on a time frame In view of the provisions of section 55 of the Indian Contract Act the vendors were entitled to rescind the contract as there was a breach of condition Coming back to the point of limitation it is clear that article 54 of the limitation act mandates that in case in uh, that uh, this case in hand the date fixed for payment for consideration was 3 months from the date of the agreement which is uh, 26th of uh, March 1997 and 27th of march 1997 in any case the time period for filing the suit commenced from 26 to 27 6 1997 and would have expired after 3 years that is in the end of june 2000 therefore the suit filed by the purchaser was clearly barred by limitation in view of the first part of article 54 of limitation act and no amount of payment of advance could have remi- remedied a uh, such a breach of contract the high court took a different approach in categorizing the specific relief act 1963 as procedure and holding that 2018 amendment is also a procedural provision which requires to be given retrospective effect this court does not subscribe to the reasoning provided by the high court for the simple reason that after the 2018 amendment specific performance is not codified as an enforceable right which is not dependent any more on equitable principles expounded by the judges rather it is founded on satisfaction of the requisite ingredients as provided under the specific relief act for determination of whether a substituted law is procedural or substantive reference to the nature of parent enactment may not be material instead it is the nature of the amendments which determine whether they are in the realm of uh, procedural or substantive law so under the pre amended specific relief act one of the major consideration for grant of specific performance was the adequacy of damages under section 14 clause 1 sub clause a however this consideration has now been completely done away with in order to provide better compensation to the aggrieved party in the form of specific performance having come to the conclusion that the 2018 amendment was not a mere procedural amendment rather it had substantive principle built into its working this court cannot hold that such amendments would apply retrospectively thus it is clear that when a substantive law is brought about by amendment there is no assumption that the same ought to be given retrospective effect rather There is a requirement for the legislature to expressly clarify whether the aforesaid amendments ought to be retrospective or not. Ordinarily, the effect of amendment by substitution would be that the earlier provisions would be repealed and amended provisions would be enacted in place of the earlier provisions from the date of inception of that enactment. 
However, if the substituted provisions contain any substantive provision which create new rights, new obligations, or take away any vested rights, then such substitution cannot automatically be assumed to ha have come into force retrospectively. In such cases, the legislature has to expressly provide as to whether such substitution is to be construed retrospectively or not. In the case at hand, the Amendment Act contemplates that the said substituted provisions would come into force on such date as the central government may appoint by notification in the official gazette or different dates may be appointed for different provisions of this Act. It may be noted that 1-10-2018 uh, was the appointed date on which the amendment provisions would come into effect. So, in the view of the same, the 2018 amendment into the uh, Specific Relief Act is prospective and cannot apply to those transactions that took place prior to its coming into force. Thus, the purchaser ought to have been vigilant in the case at hand to enforce his rights and could not have been uh, lackadaisical in his approach. From the facts, it is clear that the purchaser entered into the agreement way back on 26 or 27 March 1997, which had a clause mandating completion of the contract by payment of the remaining consideration within three months. The aforesaid clause was drafted for providing one last opportunity of the purchaser for the purchaser, I'm sorry, uh, one last opportunity for the purchaser to make good their lapse, which happened on the earlier occasion. In this context, the time for performance of the contract including the payment lasted till the month of June 1997. It was necessary that the purchaser should have taken immediate steps to complete the transaction and if such steps were immediately completed, then the purchaser would have a clear right of uh, seeking enforcement for three years reckoned from the last day decided for the completion of the contract. Further, the facts on record show that the purchaser did not voluntarily adhere to the time stipulation under the contract in order to bypass the condition of time being the essence, the purchaser invoked the standard of good faith. A faucet standard prescribes a higher duty of care for parties entering into a contract. Unless such duty is expressly stipulated, good faith standard cannot be implicitly read into any contract. The facts and the circumstances of this case show that this court cannot accept that such higher standards of good, good faith was relevant. Section 16, Clause C of the Specific Relief Act would only come into force if the purchaser was ready and willing to perform the contract within the three-month period prescribed under Clause 3 of the agreements. The opposing conclusion is also bolstered by the fact that the specific performance can only be granted when essential terms of contract are not violated in terms of Section 16 Clause B. Thus, the purchaser was not ready or willing to perform his part of the contract within the time stipulated and accordingly specific performance cannot uh, be granted for the entire contract. Regarding the issue as to whether possession was with the purchaser after entering into the agreements, to sell in 1997, the High Court has not duly considered the statement of prosecution witness number one in its proper perspective. However, the testimonies of defendant witness number two and defendant witness number three show that the purchaser was never in possession of the aforesaid land. If the agreement of sale is coupled with possession, it requires stamp duty and stamp duty has to be paid as per uh, Schedule 1A of Article 47A of the Stamp Act. Further, asking for the relief of recovery of possession also shows that the plaintiff was not in the possession of, uh, of the property. The trial court has rightly answered this point against the plaintiff and the uh, appellant court on an enormous, uh, on an, uh, I'm sorry, on an erroneous appreciation of the facts and law reversed the said findings. The records show that there was no inability on the part of the parties to perform the rest of the contract or the remaining part was waived. In this case, the purchaser breached the essential conditions of the contract, which altogether disentitles him to a claim the specific performance. There is no doubt that the claim of the purchaser is hit by delay and latches on their part as they did not take appropriate measures within the stipulated time and filling, uh, filing of the suit was delayed by the almost 
five years. Therefore, this court does not think that it is appropriate case for granting relief to the purchaser in terms of Section Twelve of the Specific Relief Act of nineteen sixty three. as the claim of the purchaser is barred by delay latches and limitation further the contract was breached due to the conduct of the plaintiff or the purchaser who were not willing to perform the contract after entering into a time sensitive agreement in any case it is an admitted fact that the plaintiff paid only part consideration though there is a four feature clause in the agreement this court with a view of rendering complete justice between the parties deems it appropriate to direct the vendors or the uh, who are the appellants uh, to repay the said amount with the interest of 7.5% per annum from the date such payment was made by the purchaser to the vendors till the entire amount is paid back this court further directs the vendors to pay the entire amount to the credit of the suit account within 6 months from the date of the receipt of the copy of the order So that's it for today. Just in case you have any queries or any questions, you can comment in the uh, in the chat box. In the important judgment titled "V S Ramakrishnan vs P M Muhammad Ali," pronounced on 9th November 2022, the respondent, the original defendant, enter into an agreement to sell with appellant, the original plaintiff, for a consideration of rupees fifty two thousand five hundred percent with respect to the disputed property. Rupees one crore was paid by the appellant to the defendant towards the earnest money of which rupees sixty five lakhs were paid in cash and rupees thirty five lakhs were were in the form of post dated check which came to be dishonored or written for the reasons payment stopped by attachment order. Plaintiff offered to pay the amount of rupees thirty five lakhs in cash but defendant refused the acts of the same. The original plaintiff instituted a suit for specific performance of agreement to sell. The trial court dismissed the suit. On appeals, the Kerala High Court held that once there was no concluded contract between the parties for the sale of the suit property, as the post dated check was written, the question whether there was readiness and willingness on the part of the plaintiff. to pay the balance sale consideration does not arise for consideration being aggrieved the plaintiff preferred the present appeals the supreme court has held that it is required to be noted that at the time when the post dated check was tendered the same cannot be said to be worthless check the post dated check written by the bank was with an endorsement that is payment stopped by attachment order as there was a raid conducted by the it department and the bank account was attached and therefore the post dated check was written however the check was not written for the reasons of insufficient funds in the bank account therefore the observation made by the high court that the post dated check was worthless check and tendering such worthless check cannot be said to be a payment our spot sale consideration cannot be accepted further though there was no specific issue framed by the trial court on readiness and willingness on the part of the plaintiff the trial court gave the findings on the same and non suited the plaintiff by observing that the plaintiff was not having sufficient funds to make the full balance consideration on or before 12th january 2006 such a finding could not have been given by the trial court without putting the plaintiff to notice and without framing a specific issue on the readiness and willingness on the part of the plaintiff there must be a specific issue framed on readiness and willingness on part of the plaintiff in a suit for specific performance and before giving any specific finding the parties must be put to notice the object and purpose of framing the issue is so that the parties to the suit can lead the specific evidence on the same on the opposite ground the judgment and order passed by the trial court dismissing the suit and refusing to pass the decree for performance a uh, specific performance of the agreement to sell confirmed by the high court deserves to be quashed and set aside and the matter is to be remanded to the trial court to frame the specific issue with respect to the readiness and willingness on the part of the plaintiff 
on remand the parties be permitted to lead the evidence on the readiness and willingness on the part of the plaintiff to perform his part of the contract more particularly whether the plaintiff was ready and willing to pay the full consideration and whether the plaintiff was having sufficient funds and or could have managed the balance sale consideration in the important judgment titled the state of jargon versus shailendra kumar roy alice pandev roy pronounced on 31st october 2022 a fair was registered against respondent based on the statement of the victim Upon completion of the investigation charge sheet was framed for offenses under sections 307 341 376 and 448 of IPC the death of the victim led to the submission of the supplementary charge sheet against respondent with reference to section 302 of IPC after the trial the sessions court convicted respondent of offenses under section 302 341 376 and 448 of IPC on appeal the jargon i court set aside the judgment of sessions court and acquitted respondent being aggrieved present appeal has been filed with issues posed for consideration and they are whether the statement of the deceased is relevant under section 32 1 of indian evidence act 1872 and whether the prosecution proved the charges against respondent beyond reasonable doubt the supreme court has held that section 32 of the evidence act provides that in certain cases statements by persons who cannot be called as witnesses are relevant dying declarations are made relevant under sub clause 1 of section 32 In terms of section 32 statements of relevant facts are themselves relevant facts when they are made by a person who is dead a person who cannot be found a person who is incapable of giving evidence or a person whose attendance cannot be procured without an amount of delay or expense class 1 indicates that in cases where the cause of a person's death comes into question A statement made by that person is relevant when it relates to the cause of death or any of the circumstances of the transaction which resulted in death. In the present case the statement uh, satisfies the conditions laid down in sub class 1 of section 32 as it relates to both the cause of death as well as to the circumstances of the transaction which resulted in death. This is because the statement clearly described that the respondent poured kerosene on her and set her on fire. The post-mortem report concludes that the cause of death is due to the burn injuries sustained by the deceased. The statement of the deceased indicates that she sustained the burn injuries as a result of the respondent having poured kerosene on her and setting her on fire. In addition the statement of the deceased discloses that the respondent raped her before setting her on fire which is a description of the circumstances of the transaction which resulted in her death the statement of the deceased therefore satisfies the conditions in section 321 of evidence act and is itself a relevant fact it shall be considered to be a dying declaration There is no rule to the fact that a dying declaration is inadmissible when it is recorded by a police officer instead of a magistrate although a dying declaration ought to ideally be recorded by a magistrate if possible it cannot be said that dying declarations recorded by police are inadmissible for that reason alone the issue of a uh, issue of whether a dying declaration recorded by the police is admissible must be decided after considering the facts and circumstances of each case in its judgment the high court incorrectly observed that in his cross examination pw6 the doctor stated that he was examining another patient in the adjacent room when the victim's dying declaration was uh, recorded The record of the cross examination indicates that the doctor stated that he was examining a patient on the adjacent table not in the adjacent room as erroneously stated by the high court. The high court mistakenly relied on this fact to hold that the victim's statement could not be treated as her dying declaration. 
Further, nothing on the record indicates that there was any enmity between the deceased and the respondent which would lead to lead the deceased to narrate an untrue account of events and falsely implicate the respondent. Therefore, the dying declaration was made voluntarily and is true. The deceased was in a competent state of mind when she made a statement to PW11, the investigating officer. There is nothing on record which gives rise to reasonable doubt as to the respondent's guilt. The witnesses, including the family members of the deceased, being declared hostile is insufficient to cause doubt upon the prosecution's case. It was not the prosecution's case that the hostile witnesses were eyewitnesses witnesses to the crime. Rather, these witnesses' testimonies were relevant mainly to show that the deceased consistently stated that the respondent raped and murdered her to different persons. The absence of evidence which, which establishes the consistency of the dying declaration over a period of time is not fatal to the prosecution's case. Thus, the prosecution proved its case beyond reasonable doubt before the Sessions Court. The High Court ought not to have overturned the Sessions Court judgment. While this court does not ordinarily interfere with orders of acquittal passed by the High Courts, it may exercise its power to do complete justice and reverse orders of acquittal to avert a miscarriage of justice. This court therefore sets aside the High Court's decision and restores the Sessions Court judgment convicting respondent of offences punishable under sections 302, 341, 376 and 448 of IPC as well as its order sentencing the respondent to rigorous imprison imprisonment for life for the offence punishable under section 302 of IPC and rigorous imprisonment for 10 years for the offence punishable under section 376 of IPC. These sentences are to run concurrently. The parting remarks are that while examining the victim, the medical board conducted the two-finger test to determine whether she was habituated to sexual intercourse. This court has time and again deprecated the use of this regressive and invasive test in cases alleging rape and sexual assault. The so-called test has no scientific basis and neither proves nor disproves allegations of rape. It instead re-victimizes and re-traumatizes women who may have been sexually assaulted and is an affront to their dignity. The two-finger test or pre vaginum test must not be conducted. In Lilu v. State of Ariana, which was reported in 2013-14 SSC 643, this court held that the two-finger test violates the right to privacy, integrity, and dignity. Whether a woman is habituated to sexual intercourse or habitual to se sexual intercourse is irrelevant for the purpose of determining whether the ingredients of Section 375 of IPC are present in a particular case. The so-called test is based upon the incorrect assumption that a sexually active woman cannot be raped. A woman's sexual history is wholly immaterial while adjudicating whether the accused raped her. Further, the probative value of a woman's testimony does not depend upon her sexual history. It is patriarchal and sexist to suggest that a woman cannot be believed when she states that she was raped merely for the reason that she is sexually active. In terms of Section 53A of the Indian Evidence Act, the evidence of a victim's character or of her previous sexual experience with any person shall not be relevant to the issue of consent or the quality of consent in prosecutions of sexual offenses. Any person who conducts the two-finger test or pre vaginum examination in contravention of the directions of this court shall be guilty of misconduct. In the important judgment titled Mariano Anto Bruno and another versus the Inspector of Police pronounced on 12th October 2022, the Supreme Court has held that positive action proximate to the time of suicide on the part of the accused which led or compelled the deceased to commit suicide should be established for conviction under Section 306 of the IPC. 
the facts of the case would be that the deceased mother lodged a complaint against Aplan number one, Aplan number two, the mother-in-law and the father-in-law of the deceased for the offences punishable under sections 498A and 306 of IPC. After that, the affair was converted from section 174 of CRPC to section 498A and 306 of IPC. After the trial, the trial court convicted the husband and the mother-in-law under section 498A and 306 of the IPC. However, it acquitted the father-in-law of deceased of all the charges. The High Court upheld the appellant's conviction for the offence under section 498A and 306 of IPC on appeal. Being aggrieved, the appellants preferred the present appeal. The Supreme Court has held that to convict an accused under section 306 of IPC, the state of mind to commit a particular crime must be visible regarding determining the culpability. Also, each suicide is a personal tragedy that prematurely takes an individual's life and has a continuing a ripple effect uh, dramatically affecting the lives of the families, friends and communities. However, the court of law should not be guided by emotions or sentiments while adjudicating. However, the dictum is required to be based on the analysis of facts and evidence on record. A bare perusal of the impunct judgment indicates that the High Court erred in recording the finding that there is sufficient evidence for convicting the appellants under Section 306 of IPC, losing sight of the fact that there exists no evidence on record indicating that the deceased was meted out with harassment by the appellants just before her death. It is well settled that not only there has to be evidence of continuous harassment, but there should be cogent evidence to establish a positive action by the accused which should more or less be proximate to the time of occurrence, which action can be said to have led or compelled the person to commit suicide. In the present case, the complaint against the appellants was filed three weeks after the deceased's death. There is no evidence concerning the offence alleged under Section 498A of the IPC meted out to the deceased by the appellants. There was no marital discord between appellant number one and the deceased during their nine years of married life. Several emails were exchanged between appellant number one and deceased sisters, whereby appellant number one was showered with praises for taking care of the deceased in the best possible manner, and credit was also given to his parents for supporting the deceased in her career. Further, it was sister of the deceased who herself sent a mail to the appellant number one saying, Emily is fighting a disorder. Thus, the deceased was suffering by bipolar disorder and had suicidal ideas from a few days before suicide. Further, the deceased was also undergoing treatment for depression as she was showing significant symptoms of depression like tiredness, poor sleep patterns and demoralized feelings to name a few. The fact that the deceased suffered from bipolar disorder was concealed from the appellant family during their marriage. The trial court and the high court did not consider the evidence of PW9, the psychiatrist, while convicting the appellants under section 306 and 498A of IPC. The appellant's conviction is solely based on the oral evidence of the mother and sister of the deceased who are interested witnesses. Postmortem report does not give the cause of the death, but on 15 December 2014, the cause of the death is shown as asphyxia due to external compression. Have we considered the facts of the present case in just opposition with the judgments referred and upon the appreciation of evidence of the eyewitnesses and other material adduced by the prosecution? This court is of the view that trial court wrongly convicted the appellants and the High Court also not justified in upholding the conviction of the appellants under section 306 and 498A of the IPC. Thus, the impunct judgment passed by the High Court and the judgment and order of the trial court are unsustainable and deserve to be set aside and are hereby set aside. The appellants are acquitted of the charges leveled against them. So, in this important judgment of Mahendra Singh and others versus State of Madhya Pradesh, 
pronounced on 3rd June 2022, the Supreme Court has held that when the court finds that a witness is wholly unreliable, neither conviction nor acquittal can be based on the testimony of such a witness. Now the facts of this case were that a charge sheet was filed against 11 accused in the court of judicial magistrate who committed the, uh, who further committed the case to the sessions court. Now the charges were framed were framed against all the 11 accused. Uh, uh, they were under the uh, the charges were under the section 148 uh, 302 read along with uh, section 149 of Indian Penal Code 1860. So now. After trial, the Honorable Court acquitted accused number 1, 2, 5, 6, 8 and 10 respectively. However, the trial court convicted accused number 3, 4, 7, 9 and 11 for the offence committed under section 148, 302 and uh, read with 149 of Indian Penal Code. And they were sentenced to one year rigorous imprisonment for the offence punishable under section 148 of IPC and life imprisonment and fine of rupees 5000 each for the offence punishable under section 302 read along with section 149 IPC. The appeal filed by the convicted and sentenced accused dismissed by the, uh, was dismissed by the Madhya Pradesh High Court being agreed the present appeals have been filed with allegation that prosecution witness number 6 could not have witnessed the incident and therefore the conviction which is based on his te testimony is vitiated. The state contended that merely because a minor contradiction or inconsistency cropped up in the evidence of the witness, it cannot be a ground to disbelieve the truthfulness of the testimony of such witness. The Honorable Supreme Court has held that the material placed on record would reveal that the conviction of the prison appellants is based basically on the testimony of prosecution witness number 6. A corroboration is sought from the medical evidence in the nature of post-mortem report. Further, the witness are of three types. We have to like uh, know this in, in, in order to understand the further case. So, for, uh, the witnesses are of three types. Number 1 are wholly reliable. Number 2 are wholly unreliable. Number three are neither wholly reliable nor wholly unreliable. So when the witness is wholly reliable, the court should not have any difficulty in as much as conviction or acquittal could be based on the testimony of such single witness. Equally, if the court finds that the witness is wholly unreliable, there would be no difficulty in as much as neither conviction nor uh, acquittal can be based on the testimony of such a witness. It is only in the third category of witnesses that the court has to be circumspect and has to look for the corroboration in material particulars by reliable testimony, direct or circumstantial. The evidence of witnesses on record would reveal that the prosecution witness number 6 could not have witnessed the incident. Therefore, the evidence of prosecution witness number 6 would fall in the category of wholly unreliable witnesses. As no such conviction could be based solely on his testimony. Thus, the corroboration sought by the High Court from the medical evidence was not justified. The medical evidence could only establish the death of the, the, the death, uh, that the death was homicidal. However, it could not have been used to corroborate the version of uh, prosecution witness number six that he has witnessed the incident. Insofar as the contention of DAG of the state that the prosecution has proved the motive is concerned, it is well settled that only because motive is established, the conviction cannot be sustained. Now, therefore, the prosecution has failed to prove the case beyond reasonable doubt and as such, the accused are entitled to be given the benefit of doubt. The impound judgment delivered by the division bench as well as the judgment and order passed by the session judge are quashed and set aside. In the important judgment titled Sukhpal Singh Kaira vs. State of Punjab pronounced on 5th December 2022, FAR was lodged against accused for offence under sections 21, 24, 25, 27 to 30 of Narcotic Drugs and Psychotropic Substance Act 1985 Section 25A of Arms Act and Section 66 of the Information Technology Act 2000. In the charge sheet, 10 accused were summoned and put to trial. 
even the second charge sheet did not name the appellant as an accused only after the initial recording of evidence the prosecution filed an application under section 311 of crpc for recalling of pw 4 and 5 which was allowed in the further examination of those witnesses they named the appellant thereafter the prosecution filed an application invoking section 319 of crpc for summoning additional five accused including the appellant the session judge allowed the application on the same day when the judgment of conviction and sentence was passed against other co-accused the appellant alleged that the session judge order was not sustainable as the same was not passed in a proceeding pending before it as at the stage when the power to summon was exercised by it the judgment of conviction and sentence was already passed earlier after the regular legal procedure appellant's challenge against sessions judge court came before the two judges bench of the supreme court and they raised few issues and thus the matters were placed before the constitutional bench to consider the questions raised the issues posed for consideration are whether the trial court has the power under section 319 of crpc for summoning additional accused when the trial with respect to other co accused ended and the judgment of conviction rendered on the same date before pronouncing the summoning order whether the trial court has the power under section 319 of the crpc for summoning additional accused when the trial in respect of certain other absconding accused whose presence is subsequently secured is ongoing or pending having been bifurcated from the main trial what are the guidelines that the competent court must follow while exercising power under section 319 of crpc is the third issue to be considered the supreme court has held that the power under section 319 of crpc is to be invoked and exercised before the pronouncement of the order of sentence where there is a judgment of conviction of the accused in the case of acquittal the power should be exercised before the acquittal order is pronounced Hence the summoning order has to precede the conclusion of trial by imposition of sentence in the case of conviction if the order is passed on the same day it will have to be examined on the facts and circumstances of each case and if such summoning order is passed either after the acquittal order or imposing sentence in the case of conviction the same will not be sustainable the trial court has the power to summon additional accused when the trial is proceeded in respect of the absconding accused after securing his presence subject to the evidence recorded in the split up or bifurcated trial pointing to the involvement of the accused sought to be summoned but the evidence recorded in the main concluded trial cannot be the basis of summoning order if such power has not been exercised in the main trial till its conclusion further the constitutional bench has issued elaborate guidelines regarding the exercise of powers under section 319 of crpc for summoning additional accused during trial and they are if the competent court finds evidence or if application under section 319 of crpc is filed regarding invol- involvement of any other person in committing the offence based on evidence recorded at any stage in the trial before passing of the order on acquittal or sentence it shall pass the trial at that stage the second one the court shall thereupon first decide the need or otherwise to summon the additional accused and pass orders thereon if the decision of the court is to exercise the power under section 319 of crpc and summon the accused such summoning order shall be passed before proceeding further with the trial in the main case third one if the summoning order of additional accused is passed depending on the stage at which it is passed the court shall up also apply its mind to the fact as to whether such summoned or accused is to be tried along with the other accused or separately the fourth one if the summoning order of the additional accused is passed Uh, depending on the stage at which it is passed the court shall also apply its mind to the fact as to whether such summon accused is to be tried along with the other accused or separately the fifth one if the decision is for joint trial the first trial shall be commenced only after securing the presence of the summoned accused 
The sixth one, if the decision is that the summon accused can be tried separately on such order being made, there will be no impediment for the court to continue and conclude the trial against the accused who were being proceeded with. If the proceeding passed in a case where the accused who were tried are to be acquitted and the decision is that the summon accused can be tried afresh separately, there will be no impediment to pass the judgment of acquittal in the main case. The eighth one, if the power is not invoked or exercised in the main trial till its conclusion and if there is a split up or bifurcated case, the power under section 319 of CRPC can be, in, can be invoked or exercised only if there is evidence to that effect pointing to the involvement of the additional accused to be summoned in the split up or bifurcated trial. The ninth one, if after arguments are heard and the case is re reserved for judgment, the occasion arises for the court to invoke and exercise the power under section 319 of CRPC. The appropriate course for the court is to set it down for rehearing. The tenth one, on setting down for rehearing, the above laid down pr procedure to decide about summoning, holding of joint trial or otherwise shall be decided and proceeded with accordingly. The eleventh one, even in such a case, at that stage, if the decision is to summon additional accused and hold a joint trial, the trial shall be conducted afresh and de novo proceedings be held. The last one, if in that circumstance the decision is to hold a separate trial in case of the summon accused as indicated earlier, the first one, the main case may be decided by pronouncing the conviction and sentence and then proceed afresh against summoned, case, summoned accused. The second one is, in the case of acquittal, the order shall be passed to that effect in the main case and then proceed afresh against summoned accused. So in the important judgment titled Manoj Pratap Singh versus the state of Rajasthan, which was pronounced on 24th of June 2022, the Supreme Court has held that it has never been the effort of the courts to somehow make the death penalty redundant and non-existent for all practical purposes. The facts of the case were that the victim was kidnapped by the appellant, the accused on the stolen motorcycle by misusing the trust gained by offer of confectionery items. Thereafter, she was raped and her head was smashed, resulting in multiple injuries including fracture or frontal bone. There were gruesome injuries on the private parts of the victim. After trial, the appellant was awarded death sentence for the offence under Section 302 of IPC, along with other punishments of imprisonment for a term of seven years and fine for the offence under Section 363 of IPC, imprisonment for a term of seven years and fine for the offence under Section 365 of IPC, imprisonment for life and a fine of for the offence under Section 376 clause 2 sub clause F of IPC and imprisonment for life and fine for the offence under Section 6 of POXO Act. The death sentence was substituted to confirmation to the High Court. On the other hand, the appellant preferred an appeal against the judgment and order of the trial court while upholding conviction of the appellant of offences punishable under Section 363, 365, 376, Clause 2, Subclause F, 302 of IPC and Section 6 of POXO Act the High Court confirmed the death sentence awarded to him. Being aggrieved, the present appeals have been filed with allegations that the present case is based on circumstantial evidence rather than absolute proof and therefore benefit of residual doubt ought to be given to the appellant. And capital sentence should not be awarded because the present case may be a rare one but it is not the rarest of rare. The issues posed for determination in these appeals were whether the conviction of the appellant calls for any interference and if conviction is maintained, then whether the death sentence awarded to the appellant deserves to be affirmed or deserves to be substituted by any other sentence. The Supreme Court has held that the, in the present case is based on circumstantial evidence where, uh, where the trial court and the high court concurrently recorded their finding, findings that the prosecution was able to successfully establish the chain of circumstances which is projected by the prosecution is complete in its entirety and leads only to the result that the appellant was a person who kidnapped, raped and murdered the victim who is a seven and a half years old mentally and physically challenged girl. Hence, the concurrent findings leading to the conviction of the appellant call for no interference and deserves to be confirmed. 
Further, in the case of the present nature, the crime was of extreme depravity, which shocks the conscience, particularly looking to the target who is a seven and a half year old mentally and physically disabled girl, and then looking to the manner of committing murder, where the helpless victim headed was literally smashed, resulting in multiple injuries, including fracture of frontal bone. This is apart from the fact that the innocent victim was kidnapped on a stolen motorcycle by misusing the trust gained by the offer of confectionery items and also apart from the fact that she was brutally and inhumanly raped. Taking up the test parameters pertaining to the criminal, of course, he has a family with wife, a minor daughter, an aged father and the crime was committed when he was only 28 years of age. However, these mitigating factors are pitied against several other factors pertaining to the appellant himself. One being of his activities and actions before the present crime where he was found involved in at least four cases with offences ranging from Section 3 of Prevention of Damage to Public Property 1984 Act, Section 379 of IPC and even 307 of IPC. Second being the fact that the present case itself was carried out with the aid of the stolen motorcycle. Third, and crucial one being his conduct post-conviction where he not only earned seven days punishment in jail for quarrelling with a co-inmate, but he has been convicted for the offence of murder of another jail inmate. Read as, read as a whole, the fact sheet concerning the appellant leads only the logical deduction that there is no possibility that he would not relapse again in this crime, if given any indulgence. A fortiori, there appears no probability of his reformation and rehabilitation. This possibility of the appellant relapsing in the same crime over and over again and nil probability of his reformation or rehabilitation is a direct challenge as also danger to the maintenance of order and law in the society. Hence, the facts of the present case taken as a whole make it clear that it is unlikely that the appellant, if given any absolution, would not be capable of and would not be inclined to commit such a crime again. Consequently, this court find out, finds out it to be a case of no other option but to confirm the death sentence awarded to the appellant, for that being inevitable in this particular case. Therefore, the conviction of the appellant of offences under Section 363, 365, 376 Clause 2 Subclause F, 302 of IPC and Section 6 of the POCSO Act is confirmed and the sentences awarded to the appellant including the death sentence of the offence under Section 302 of IPC is also confirmed. In the important judgment titled Varsha Garg vs State of Madhya Pradesh which is pronounced on 8th August 2022, the Supreme Court has held that an application under Section 311 of CRPC cannot be dismissed merely on the ground that it will lead to filling in the loopholes of the prosecution's case. The facts of the case would be that an advocate was brutally murdered outside his office. So, following the homicide, FIR was registered for an offence punishable under Section 302, read with Section 34 of IPC. An application was filed under Section 311 of CRPC seeking to summon the nodal officers of certain cellular entities along with the decoding registers to trace the mobile numbers of accused on the grounds that the document which the prosecution desired to summon does not form a part of the investigation. And the uh, document has not been obtained during the course of the investigation and the same was rejected by the Sessions Court. So consequently, on the same day, the trial court also recorded that the evidence of the prosecution stood closed. The appellant, the spouse of the deceased, challenged the trial court order before the High Court invoking its jurisdiction under Section 482 of CRPC. The High Court upheld the same and being aggrieved, the present appeal has been filed. The Supreme Court has held that the objection which was raised by the respondents regarding the bar under Section 301 of CRPC on the basis of which it was argued that it is not open to the appellant who is the spouse of the deceased to pursue the proceeding lacks substance. Subsection 1 of Section 301 of CRPC, it stipulates that the public prosecutor or the assistant public prosecutor in charge of the case may appear without the written authority before any court in which the case is under 
inquiry, trial or appeal. Subsection 301 of a CRPC postulates that if such case any uh, private person instructs a pleader to prosecute any person in court, the public prosecutor or the assistant public prosecutor in charge of the case shall conduct the prosecution and the pleader so instructed shall act under the directions of the public prosecutor or the assistant public prosecutor and may with the permission of the court submit written arguments after the evidence is closed in the case. In the present case, the application for the summoning if witness and for the production of the decoding register was submitted by the state. Hence, the bar contained in section 301 of CRPC does not stand in the way. The power under section 311 of CRPC can be exercised at any stage of any inquiry, trial or other proceedings under the CRPC. The latter part of section 311 of CRPC states that the court shall summon and examine or recall or re-examine any such person if his evidence appears to the court to be essential to the just decision of the case. Section 311 of CRPC contains a power upon the court to uh, broad terms. The statutory provision must be read purposively to achieve the intent of the statute to aid in the discovery of truth. The power of the court is not constrained by the closure of the evidence. Therefore, it is clear that the broad powers under section 311 of CRPC are to be governed by the requirement of justice. The power must be exercised where the court finds that any evidence is essential for the just decision of the case. The statutory provision goes to emphasize that the court is not a helpless bystander in the derailment of justice. Quite to the contrary, the court has a vital role to discharge in ensuring that the cause of discovering truth as an aid in the realization of justice is manifest. Section 91 of CRPC empower any court to issue summons to a person in whose possession or power a document or thing is believed to be, where it considers that production of the said document or thing is necessary or desirable for the purpose of any investigation, inquiry, trial or any other proceedings under the CRPC. So in the present case, the application for the prosecution for the production of decoding registers is relatable to the provisions of section 91 of CRPC. So the decoding registers are sought to be produced through the representatives of the cellular companies in whose custody of possession they are found. The decoding registers are a very relevant piece of evidence to establish the co-relationship between the location of the accused and the cell phone tower. The reasons which weighed with the high court and the trial court in dismissing the application are extraneous to the power which is conferred under section 91 of CRPC. On the one hand and section 311 of CRPC on the other hand. So the summons to produce a document or other thing under section 91 of CRPC can be issued where the court finds that the production of the document or the thing is necessary or desirable for the purpose of any investigation, trial or proceeding under CRPC. As discussed earlier, the power of uh, under section uh, 311 of CRPC to summon a witness is conditioned by the requirement that the evidence of the person who is sought to be summoned appears to the court to be essential to the just decision of the court. So, prosecution witness number 33, 41, 43 and 48 who were the nodal officers of IDEA, Airtel, Reliance, Vodafone have already been examined. The relevance of the decoding register clearly emerges from the statement of prosecution witness number 41. Hence, the effort of the prosecution to produce the decoding uh, register which is a crucial and vital piece of evidence ought not to have been obstructed. In terms of the provision of section 311 of CRPC, the summoning of the witness for the purpose of producing the decoding register was essential for the just decision of the case. The objection of the respondent was that the application should not be allowed as it will lead to filing of the lacuna of the prosecution's case. However, even the said reason cannot be an absolute bar to allowing an application under section 311 of CRPC. So in the present case, the importance of decoding registers was raised in the examination of prosecution witness number 
41. Accordingly, the recording registers merely being additional documents required to be able to appreciate the existing evidence in the form of call details which are already on record but uses codes to signify the location of the accused, a crucial detail which can be decoded only through the decoding registers. The right of the accused to a fair trial is not prejudiced. The production of the decoding registers fits into the requirement of being relevant material which was not brought on record due to inadvertence. In the present appeal, the argument that the application was filed after the closure of the evidence of the prosecution is manifestly erroneous. As noted already, the closure of the evidence of the prosecution took place after the application for the production of decoding registers and for summoning of the witness under section 311 of CRPC was dismissed. Though the dismissal of the application and the closure of prosecution evidence both took place on 13th of November 2021, the application by the prosecution was filed on 15th of March 2011, nearly 8 months earlier. As a matter of fact, another witness for the pro prosecution was also released after examination and cross-examination on the same day as recorded in the order dated 13th November 2021 of the trial court. Therefore, the decision of the High Court which is impung in the appeal is unsustainable. The application filed by the prosecution for the production of the decoding registers and for the summoning of the witnesses of the cellular companies for that purpose is allowed. So I hope you'll find this video helpful.